evening and welcome to the virtual women's club for TWC Meets the Artist. My name is Augusta Soplin. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this evening we're all meeting on Aboriginal lands. I'm calling in from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, which has only recently been known as Dulwich Hill in Sydney's inner west. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, elders past, present and emerging for their connection to and care of country for more than 60,000 years. I acknowledge this deep connection to the water ways to the land, birds, animals and plants, which are celebrated through practices of culture, through song, in dance and through storytelling. And I acknowledge that this country was never ceded, that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to the very first event for October's TWC Meets the Artist series. I'd like to thank you all, uh, our members and our guests, for joining us online, though for many today marks a new step towards reopening in some parts of Australia. The Women's Club decided to keep this digital series going in October, um, not just because there are just so many amazing artists in our city to speak with, but for many of those joining us online from regional New South Wales, the country and the world, it's wonderful to be connected to you. But for those members keen to get back to the club, we'll be opening up again for double vaccinated members from next week. Through the Meet the Artist series, we hope you find some inspiration and appreciation for some of our leading artists and cultural thinkers, performers and makers, some you might know, some you think you might know, and others you might discover. And tonight, we start our week featuring artists with memoirs, and I'm very excited to introduce to you the very incredible Francesca Emerson. Francesca is a woman of many firsts. She was one of the first black Playboy bunnies at the New York Playboy Club. She was the first black woman to be initiated into the Film, film Editors Guild 776 as an assistant film editor. She was the first black real estate broker to open an office in Selma, Alabama. The first black American woman to be invited to speak at the Rotary Club in the Blue Mountains of Australia. And possibly the first and possibly only woman slash grandmother in her welding class. And I'm very happy to say this is the first time we've featured her as a part of the Women's Club program, despite the fact she's visited our clubs many times. Um, just a reminder, if you've got a question for Francesca, please feel free to use the Q&A function um, in Zoom to ask any questions or make any comments. Uh, good evening and welcome, Francesca. How are you? Well, I am great. I am so honored to be here. I, you know, I'm just so pleased. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so glad that you can be with us today because you have, of course, had such a spectacular life, which I always love hearing about. And I'm wondering if you could, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us a little bit about your beginning. Can you tell us a bit about you and where you're from? Well, um, I was born and raised in New York City, Harlem. Um, I am um, a mother of three children, three handsome grandsons, three beautiful granddaughters, and a wife of three <laughs> husbands. <laughs> That's a lot of threes in there. Yeah, it certainly is. And I'm also a triple A. So I'm African American Australian. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's yes. awfully auspicious. Uh -huh. right. <laughs> so, um, but you've already, God, you said everything about me. I don't know what else to. Oh, you know, that is, that's not true, Miss Fran. So basically, you started, so you grew up in Harlem, mm -hmm. and then suddenly, you you and flash forward some years okay um, and you find yourself in Australia you're a person who makes metal sculpture do you want to talk a little bit about your artistic practice at the moment and what you're working what you've been working on well I haven't actually done much uh welding but except for the my piece that I did for the Blake Prize which I love which was called the Black Madonna mm-hmm but um, I'm actually, that's funny you should mention that I'm actually getting ready to do a new um, blog uh, podcast called Ask Franny. Well, I haven't decided if it's going to be Ask Franny or Dare Franny. And so it's really about uh, women of my, uh, my age, 60 and over, about the golden years that we're living. So it's all about great relationships, great sex. Uh, <laughs> You know, so, 
yeah, so a podcast. So that's what I'm working on right now. But um, I have been, you know, just really busy, just embracing, enjoying life out there, walking and cooking and meeting people. Well, not meeting people because we can't talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, you have had, like, as I mentioned up top, you've had many professions in your career. Right. You've, you've been a model and a Hollywood actress, a film right. editor, a real estate agent. You right. also were a sort of like a travel agent sort of adventurer at one stage as well. And recently you wrote a memoir. Right. So, so I'm wondering, how did all of this happen? Was this all created by a series of five-year plans? Oh, no, isn't that funny you should say that? Because I was thinking when I look, reflect back on my, my life, I have actually have done a lot of things, but I think it's uh, out of choice, um, sort of happenstances, uh, occurrences, events uh, that has determined the path my life has gone, the direction I've gone, rather than conscious thought. Because, you know, a lot of people think about what they want to be very young, a doctor, a lawyer, or a scientist. Well, I never thought about it. I was just that kind of woman who got on the edge of the cliff and jumped in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and so in the very beginning, uh, I think Playboy was very influenced in my life because it really opened up a lot of doors for me as far mm -hmm. as, as you said, being an actress, doing commercials. Now we're talking about early sixties when there was still a lot of racial and you know racial segregation going on and unlike Gloria Steinem um I really didn't find the costumes that bad I actually I actually enjoyed uh Playboy and I thought that Hefner really enjoyed women he really was not a misogynist as we think he was not a sexist he treated we women we Playboy bunnies as stars. And so what I learned was a lot of confidence. I learned how to, uh, I made a lot of money. So I learned about uh, that, that, mon that money is power and power is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, wow. And so, so as I said, that was the beginning for me, Playboy. From there, it was just the doors just kept opening to, for me. I, I traveled around the world. I mingled with the rich and famous. And uh, my life has been so amazing and I'm so blessed and I'm just so grateful. And as, a, as you would say, as an octogenarian that I've had 80 years on this planet and all I can say, thank you God for such a beautiful life. <laughs> So look, our imaginations run wild yeah. inside the women's club because we're, we're pretty clever, um, but we're pretty imaginative as well. So we're wanting to know actually about the New York Playboy Bunny Club. How did you find yourself there? What was the step that got you in that door before that opened everything else? What was it like? Like we, we can imagine a lot of things, but yeah. is it what we think it was? No, well, the interesting thing is I had no idea about the Playboy Club. I was 20 year, 21 years old. I was very young. I was in the process of divorce. I had two children. I was working at Bloomingdale's and I had this beautiful Turkish lover who said to me, well, you should go and be a, a Playboy bunny. And I said, a bunny? I said, what is a bunny? And he just laughed because he didn't. He said, you don't know anything about a bunny. And I said, the only thing I know about a bunny is the chocolate bunnies that I buy for my children on Easter. <laughs> so he said, uh, he, he said, chocolate bunny. He said, that's great. He said, you should use that line when you go in for an interview. So he actually took me on that, took me to that interview. And I met with um, Hugh Hefner's brother, Keith Hefner, who was hiring the girls. And I was, I was hired on the spot. And so the following day I had to go, the next day I had to go back for what they call a training and costume fitting. And so they actually fit you, each costume is fit for each girl. You have to buy your own stockings and you have to buy the shoes to match, which was satin shoes. And you have your little bunny tail and your bunny ears. And 
it was really a very hard job. As a matter of fact, when I went through the training, I actually failed it because I couldn't hold the tray. So, because I was such a tiny little thing. So they finally made me what they call the concession girl. So I, I was work cigarettes. So I was, um, so I sold cigarettes and cigars and the little Playboy lighters. And so I was able to walk up because the New York Playboy Club was on five floors, so five levels. And so I went up and down those levels selling cigarettes and, and cigars. And then finally I realized that all where the money was was in the showrooms because that's where they did the entertaining. And so I said, I wanted to try again for, you know, to, to work the floors, what they call it. So I finally got to learn how to do the bunny dip and all and the bunny perch and the high carry. And so I got to, I got to become a showroom bunny, which was, uh, which was fantastic. Wow. And so how did you go from being really, it sounds like you're a waitress. Well, you are a waitress. You're a high paid waitress. <laughs> you're, a high paid, you're a high paid, interestingly dressed waitress. Right, yes. That into Hollywood. Well, uh, I got fired from Playboy. Because, well, because I was old, I, you know, I was 27 years old and already I was old. So they were looking for, you know, newer, younger, prettier women. But anyway, so I went from Playboy to working on the Playboy After Dark. And then from that, I went to work at Motown Records. And then I found out from a friend of mine who worked at Universal Studios that there was uh, an opening, they, the, there was a opening program for the train minorities. So I was hired as, I was the only black woman as meth. I always like to say I was a twofer because I was, I was a woman and I was black. So I trained a whole year at all of the major studios. And then I was finally hired by Universal Studios as, a, as an assistant film editor, which I got to work on feature films like uh, The China Syndrome with Michael Douglas and Jane Fonda and Jack Lemmon. And uh, one, I think one of my first films was called Bingo Long Traveling, Traveling All Stars and Motor Kings, which was about a black baseball uh, team that uh, bombed storm uh, the South. And James Earl Jones was in that and Richard Pryor. And that was my first time South in Macon, Georgia. <laughs> Oh. And that was really an experience for me. Um, so, but I, I got to uh, do, a, I got to go to the film con Fest festival. Um, oh God, I, I got, I, there's so many things I got to do. I just can't remember them all at this moment. And, <laughs> but, no, that's fine. And yeah. so, so I guess you, you also, um, besides being on screen you've also mm -hmm. had a career as a film editor how mm -hmm. did you get into that well as i was just saying to you i my friend andy who worked for jean coon who was one of the writers for star trek and oh. she knew that that there was going to be this program opening and i and i applied for it and i got and i got pulled in each other so there were five of us there were five minorities there were four men and one girl so there were two black guys, one Chinese, one Mexican, and me. <laughs> right. And so you did that for a bit. And while you were doing that, um, mm -hmm. were you married at this stage? Or you? Oh, no, no. I was long. I was, well, actually, was I married at this stage? Well, I wasn't married to my first husband. I know that. Yeah, I was. I still, my, I had, no, actually, I had already gotten rid of my second husband. <laughs> I read of, you don't mean murder. You mean no, murder. I didn't murder, but I meant I did I, <laughs> No, no. So no, I was not married. I was quite single at the time I started working uh -huh. at, at Universal Studios. Right, yes. right. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about, um, so so it sort of sounds like you, you work your way through, as you said, happenstance and also mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. At one stage, your Turkish lover helps you define your career. Right. And, then, and then at some stage, what's, what's the sort of... Um, the, the big step when you when you start thinking oh I might go to Australia what's the link there like how did you how did you get oh well Australia was again I'm talking about how how 
choices will change your whole life. And I had just spoken up with the man, the Czech director I had lived with for over 12 years and that was the love of my life. And, and so I wanted to get as far away from him as possible and Australia was it. So I came here and I, in 1991 and I fell in love with Australia. And what did, you, what did you love about it? Well, I, I tell you what, Sydney reminded me in 1991, it reminded me of California in the 60s. It was sort of very, I mean, it was so small and quaint and everybody was so beautiful and everyone, you know, stopped me and asked about me and you're American and where you, what are you doing? Why are you here? And uh, as a matter of fact, that was during the time of the Gulf War. And I remember they would ask me questions about that to the the point I decided I was no longer American I became Canadian uh, yeah. <laughs> so that I wouldn't have to discuss what was going on in America but I I loved it so much that I stayed here for six months and that, that was a time when you could get a six months visa and then my visa ran out so I went to uh, New Zealand for three weeks and then came back oh wow uh, yeah so um so and then I started coming back almost every year every year every other year uh, to uh, to my to my homeland. <laughs> to your other homeland. To my other homeland. I, I I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you recently became an Australian as well. Yes, about two years ago. Yes. Yeah. Wow. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, this year it'll be three years. October seventeenth. Oh. I've, I've been, yeah, we're not too far away. That'll we're be not too far today. away. Yes, exactly. That, that's that's wonderful. Um, yeah. so. So were there sort of, um, cause you've traveled a lot. You said, you said you've traveled a lot and there's a lot about travel in your book, actually. Uh -huh. um, I'm just wondering, um, you could have lived anywhere in the world, but you sort of came here and you, you settled down here. Um, I'm wondering, um, you, you still though maintain a bit of a life over in Selma, Alabama. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, well, I have a house there. I have a beautiful house that was built in 1873, just right after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And so what I do, my perfect thing is to spend six months in Australia and six months in America. So I've been doing that for about three or four years, but because of the lockdown, so, you know, I haven't been able to do that. So I would, I would like to do that. I would like to continue doing six months and six months. And that way I still get to see family and friends because I still have uh, children. I have two daughters that still live in America, although I have a son and grandson who lives here. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, so I still like to travel and as, um, and, you know, I'm just still living in the moment, still having adventures wherever I can find it or wherever it finds me. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you've um, very brazenly, and, and I'm just wanting to show everyone, this is, this is your book. It's uh -huh. uh, The Chocolate Bunny. Mm -hmm. And it says here that basically um, you are Playboy Bunny model, Hollywood actress, Mafia Mole. <laughs> and love it to some of the screen's most glamorous leading men. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know that you're also a lover of Leonard Cohen. And oh. I'm wondering if you could tell us the Leonard Cohen story. Oh, that is one of, that is the story that I will remember for the rest of my life. That was one of the most special times of my life, meeting that man, you know, and I, when I think about how brazen I was, you know, we, uh, a friend of, I hadn't, I didn't know who he, I, I, I always, I knew him from, a, from afar and I loved his music because I had just gotten back from London and so at, he was the rage at the time. And so when I walked into this restaurant and there was this Lennox Cohen, I thought, oh my God, Lennox Cohen, I love you, I love you. And so I remember saying to him, sing me a song, you know, sing me. He said, well, I don't have my um, guitar with me. I said, so where is it? He said, it's at my hotel. I said, so where's your hotel? He said, at the Chateau Mama. I said, well, that's just next door. Go and get it and come back. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He went, got that guitar, came back to that booth, sat down and serenaded me. And do you know the song that he sang you? The first one was Oh Suzanne. Oh, right. Yes. 
Yes. So from that moment onwards. So that moment on, well, it's actually, if you read the book, it'll tell you sort of a little bit sort of because I actually was living with someone at the time. <laughs> so I was having this uh, affair, this sordid affair with, 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 uh, with Lenny Cohen, you know, oh. so, um, but anyway, I'll, I'll let you, if you really want to know the details, you have to read the book. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. There's a, there's a couple of those kind of yeah. uh, cliffhangers yeah. that I could give yeah. about yeah. the book at the moment, because there's, um, there's a quite, a, there's quite a lot of different people here, but there's yeah. one, chapter 15 is called A Naked Masseuse and a Mysterious <laughs> Woman with Red Hair. I, oh, so, Mom Sharif, that's one, I, you know what, that's one of my favorite stories, actually. Yeah? Yeah, because Omar Sharif, I mean, here's a man who is a screen idol. The women just love him. And when he was sitting at my dining room table telling me this story about this woman who would follow him around the world to every set that he was on, she would, she would arrive. But he never spoke to her. I said, what do you mean you never spoke to her? He said, well, he said, I didn't want to spoil the dream or the fantasy because I had this fantasy about her. And I thought that if I would actually approach her, how do you say, she would evaporate uh, like, 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 like a cloud <laughs> in the sky. And so he never talked to this woman. I was so shocked about that, you know, that this woman, obviously was besotten with him that she would travel around the world to be on every set that he was that he was on you know mm -hmm. and so um so i've i've met omar sharif a, a couple of times because the uh yvonne passer the director the czech director i was living with was getting ready had done a movie with him and uh so that's how they how how they knew each other and he was ready to and he was bringing a, a screenplay for him to, to do that he wanted, he was interested in. So he came for dinner and this conversation of the, the, the woman in red mm. in the book. Yeah. And that, that sort of speaks a little bit about the sort of, um, I guess, the elusive nature, I suppose, of some choices as well, some choices not to do. Right. It. But I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if there are things Francesca, that you've, uh, you know, looking back and especially writing a book mm -hmm. where you, you look back and you think, oh, gee, I wish I had done this or I'd done uh -huh. this sooner or yeah. I wish that I'd never done that or never met that person. Yeah. You know, how, does, how does that all, how do you reconcile that when you're... Well, I tell you what, I don't really have any regrets because I, I believe that... Um, uh, that there are no mistakes in life it's just lessons learned mm -hmm. and that if i had to if there's one thing that i wish i had done it was to go to to go to school and get a degree to go to college because i never went to college you know i went to a you know to a junior college but i never finished it you know so if i would have to do anything i would would i would love to be able to have a, a degree but 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 that has not spoil my life in one way or, or the other. And, um, and I think the other thing is that um, if I had something I would like to do, I think I would like to go out, and before I go out of this life, I would like to go and parachute jump. <laughs> I did not see that coming. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think that I would, yeah, I would like to do that before, maybe for my 81st birthday when it's coming up soon. Yeah. yeah. So this year at your 80th birthday party, mm -hmm. you were described by your current husband, mm -hmm. Roger Foley Fogg, as mm -hmm. more like four 20 year olds than an octogenarian. Yes. Well, I do have a lot of energy. This is true. I really do. Yeah. And I know uh, people ask me all the time, where do you get that energy from? And, and I don't know. I'm just, I love to learn new things because I'm constantly, I say I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. But I find that when I don't know something, I try to find out about it. And when I've learned it, I've owned it. I own it. I know I own it. So then I move on to something else. So, and I think probably that's because I don't have a college education. So, and because I was a young mother at 18, uh, that I didn't go to school. I was busy taking care of children and husbands and lovers and 
and family. So now I just want to go out there and, 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 you know, and live and live a life and enjoy, live an adventure. Well, I am living an adventure. I can't for sure. <laughs> I think we met, we met quite a few years ago. And I remember something that you said really sort of stuck out in my mind, which was, I think one of your kids was saying something to you. And I think you were probably, you were 72 or 74 when you told me this. Mm -hmm. You said, you turned to them and said, look, you, you're going through your own stuff. Mm -hmm. This is my time now. This is my, this is, mm -hmm. it's, it's my life. <laughs> no, no, it is. I'm being very selfish now. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm going for my passion. And if anything, I would like to say to the ladies out there is, Find something you love to do. Find that passion. Embrace it. Don't let anyone tell you you can't can't do something. And 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 be happy. You know, I'm just so like I'm tired of being around people who are always sad or or you know. Well, not so. Much, well, I just would like people to be more positive. Being around negative people. Mm -hmm. And so I think is we need to we as women, but particularly we women we golden year women <laughs> need to get out there and embrace it, embrace life, enjoy what's around us, you know, and, and suck it in, take it in, you know, because we don't know how long we're going to be here on this earth. You know, I know I'm 80 and who knows, I can live another day or I can live another 10 years. But in the meantime, I'm going to take every single day as if it's my last day. <laughs> <laughs> you, certainly, yeah. you certainly have <laughs> lived life very much to the fullest, Miss Fran, yeah. and yeah. Um, we mm -hmm. really do um, think it's amazing whenever you're in the presence of mm -hmm. us in the club. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, um, for people really curious about The Chocolate Bunny, um, where can they buy this book? Where can they find it? Well, they could find it. I understand it's you can get it on Booktopia, Booktopia mm -hmm. and you can also get it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think it's on three or four different book sites. You just have to, you just have to, when you put in Fr uh, Chocolate Bunny, you have to put in Francesca Emerson, because if you just put in Chocolate Bunny, you get all kind of chocolate stuff coming up. <laughs> like Easter. Yeah, it's a lot of Easter. Yeah, right. stuff yeah. So, um, but yeah, so it's um, Amazon. Amazon, okay, and Booktopia, absolutely. Yeah. I've got to, I've got to show. This is, this is one of the pictures of you in your bunny. Oh yeah, wonderful that costume. Yeah, and there's a really fantastic picture as well that's in this book from when you were a model, um, as well, because um, mm -hmm. you didn't really talk much about your modeling career in this. In well, this, well, but... the modeling was short lived because most of that was really actually done in in, in New York. Um, because when I got to LA, you know, the modeling career fell apart because, and particularly as an actress, because I couldn't act, you know, I know when, oh yeah, that was that, that I love that photo that was taken in Rome by, uh, by, by a, an Italian, uh, she was a, a model turned, uh, photographer. Mm. Yeah. Incredible. Well, we've actually got um, Bronwyn has just put in a little link um, saying, Francesca, thank you. Try, there's a website here for free online university courses. No <laughs> high school diploma needed. Pick your subject and have fun. Best wishes, Bronwyn. Which oh, is Bronwyn, thank you. But you know what? I thought about that and I thought, no, I just don't have time. I mean, it's, seriously, I'm not going to be sitting up all night trying to study and to learn something. I'm learning life now and each day. That's 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 my college degree. I'm, I'm, my college degree is the 80 years I've already put into it. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, um, Miss Fran. It's always a pleasure to be around you, and I think oh, we'll be in, enjoy um, welcoming you back into the women's club um, when we're all fully open. Okay. And so, 